Well, good morning, guys, and welcome. Thank you for coming to uh, another webinar. My name is Justin Taylor. I'm with Rock Title Agency. Um, I cover. My name is Justin Taylor. Well, we got a little bit of feedback there. I cover the Scottsdale and Paradise Valley territories. Uh, uh, our main office is in Scottsdale. However, we do have locations across the valley, including the Southeast Valley, uh, which Dia Heinrichs uh, covers that. And then we also have the West Side as well, which Amy Hollister. Uh, covers that. So uh, we're a full service title and escrow company. Uh, we would love to schedule time with you guys to go over agent accountability, uh, business audits, um, all that good stuff. We will definitely link our info uh, in the chat box below. Um, but we are here today because we have uh, the pleasure to host today's event with our number one rock star team of 2020 and who is on track to uh, take that award and title again this year. So uh, we're super excited today to hear from two of the best agents uh, and team leaders here in the Valley on how they have been able to successfully uh, navigate our current market here. We know it's been a challenge over the last uh, year, um, in some ways a good way, but uh, they've been uh, successfully able to navigate the current market and uh, we're gonna learn how they are winning in multiple offer situations uh, for their clients and uh, what they're teaching their agents. Uh, so. A little history of Morgan and Josh and the Mojo team. So that uh, last year in 2020, they sold over $70 million in, in real estate. Uh, they've been awarded Realty One Group's highest achievement award the past five consecutive years. Actually, I think this year was at the sixth year uh, for, the, uh, for this year. Uh, and both in Morgan and Josh are licensed brokers and they are ranked in the top half percent uh, here in the Valley. Um, and uh, they were established in 2005. Combined experience between the both of them, 30 years. So they've got a lot of gold, a lot of experience. Um, we are super excited to hear uh, about the uh, multiple offers uh, today because it's so relevant currently in the market. There's a lot of agents struggling out there, no matter who you're talking to. So uh, thank you guys so much for putting this on again. We really appreciate it. And the agent feedback has been over the last two uh, so much value coming from it. So we really do uh, appreciate you sharing uh, what you guys are doing and, and your experience. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And uh, just to get started, I'm Josh, not, not Morgan. <laughs> and, so. we were, and we run the Mojo team here out of uh, the Scottsdale Realty One office. And we're going to try, we have so much information. We're going to try and get through all of it as quickly as possible. We know that your time is valuable. And so we're going to try and keep it down to an hour. So please save all of your questions to the very end. Um, we'll do a little question and answer period there. And then also, uh, we will make this link in the Zoom meeting available. So if you want to watch it again, or if you uh, if you want to go through and take notes right now, we also have someone taking notes, so we can provide that to you as well. But anyways, yeah, that definitely. being said, I guess uh, we'll get started. We'll, we'll definitely jump in. Yeah, you know, just out there, as we know, you know, this is a, a crazy market, pretty much unprecedented. We're at... Uh, all-time high levels as far as even going back into 2008 and everything else we're at record low number of listings and we know that you know it's it's a it's a it's a war out there i mean our agents are battling we're all battling and and so we really put this together to try to you know take some of our best practices on how we are navigating this market and some of the things we think we can do and even should do to uh you know improve your so and offer accepted out there and and just really how to win the war. And uh, is the market going to crash? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to save that for the end. Yep. So Stay uh, tuned. Stay tuned. We will get to that. We will definitely cover that. But uh, that being said, like I said, we have so much information. We're going to just run through it. We're going to speak really quickly. So take great notes. But um, let's start off with buyers. If, yeah. you, if you are representing a buyer in this crazy market and probably dealing with, you know, submitting multiple offers on all different properties with these guys, um, how to get your offer and your client to stand out from the rest. Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, uh, we recommend uh, advising your client. Yeah. It, number one, you've got to start out and just, you know, if they're not familiar with the market, many are these days, many know what they're up against, but just in case they're not, you want to give them an overview. We want to, you know, advise them that, it, hey, it's a hot market. We're seeing many multiple offers over list price. You know, gone are the days where you're going to be able to come in and, and roll over an offer, lowball it over there, five, 10% below ask, looking for a ton of repairs, a new roof, et cetera, et cetera. 
you're going to have to be competitive and you want your offer to be competitive. Yeah. Um, and you also want to make sure that they get uh, at the very least pre-approved or sorry, pre-qualified. But we recommend getting them pre-approved because obviously they're going to show more strength in that offer and that pre-approval um, yeah. than just coming in with uh, nothing or just a, a very weak pre-qual. Yep. It's 100% a must. Um, you know, I even think it's a good idea to show proof of funds for a down payment. If it's a larger down payment, you know, go that extra mile, do that little thing that's going to set your client apart is, is really a thing. Yep. So number two on our list, uh, we strongly recommend that you call the listing agent. So you want to call the listing agent, you want to find out at the very minimum, what is important to the seller? What terms or, or, you know, obviously price is always going to be important, but what terms are very attractive to the seller that's going to make your offer stand out? Um, obviously they might come back with something silly like, oh, well buy it as is, no inspection period, no financing or whatever like that. But more importantly, I think you're looking for, you know, when does the seller want to close? Um, you know, how do they, do they need a, a, a post-possession? Um, do they want to lease back the property for a number of months? You know, what's their situation and what are their pain points and what's going to really, you know, what's something that they really want uh, in an offer? Yeah. Have a great conversation with them. Be their friend. Let them know your client is going to close on the property, will close on the property. You really want to, you know, also get out of them when they plan to respond to all offers. You know, do they have a deadline in place? You know, of course, how many other offers are on the table, how many they're expecting. You know, you're trying to, to glean as much information as possible, but really getting them, because some, some agents don't have a plan in place and they don't know when they're going to respond to an offer. Um, and specifically for dealing with those agents, you want to be sooner with the game. You want to get your offer over sooner than later uh, because they may just take the first one that comes in. Yep. And it's also a good time to befriend the listing agent too. So uh, once again, we all like to work with other people that, that we like and know and trust. And so if you're able to take five or 10 minutes and just and just build that relationship with the listing agent and explain to them how, how, what, a, what a great transaction is going to be and how easy it's going to be, whether you're a solo agent or if you're on a team, you know, talk about you know, your transaction coordinator and how great they are and how, how the process is going to run super smoothly. Um, you know, take that time to really kind of befriend, not only talk up the, your client and how qualified they are, and how what a, what the perfect house this is for them, but also how you're going to make this such an easy transaction. Yeah, it's very clear and, and even verbalize that. Hey, I'm great to work with. I return calls. You know, I'm prompt. I'm on top of it. Well, I'm going to see this this deal through. I've got great inspectors. You know, I'm here to help the process go smoothly. Everybody wants to work with another agent that's going to be responsive and help uh, work towards the common goal of getting the deal done. You know, nobody wants to work with a deadbeat on the other end and and that person's offer might be a you know a great offer but if the agent's a pain to work with that's going to be factored in in this market and it's important to be aggressive but don't be annoying you know we don't want to work with an agent who is uh constantly pestering us and whatnot you know obviously that's not going to make for a great transaction but i think now's a great time to be aggressive in this market you have to be if you want your client and your offer to stand out yeah definitely you know, from that point, you're, you're armed with some information. You know, you really want to go back to your client, inform them of your discussion, and then strategize for that offer. That's really the number three, inform and strategize. Yeah, coming up with uh, with the price, what are you guys going to go in at? So um, Morgan and I, you know, obviously, we like to have another conversation with our clients about how hot the market is, how hot this property is. If they like it, there's probably 10 to 20 other buyers or more that also really love this property and are going to be putting their best foot forward. So now's not the time to try and try and save a few thousand dollars here or there. Now's the time to come in with, with a very clean offer, um, try to make the terms as simple as possible, but also price. Obviously, that's key. So um, one comment that I like to share with all my clients is when you go to bed at night, are you going to sleep well knowing that you put your best foot forward? And if you don't get the property, you're going to be okay with that. Because I don't want any of my clients to beat themselves up or be upset if we don't get the property. But I also want them to put their best foot forward to, to give them the best chance of getting the property. Now is not the time to kind of hold five or ten or $20,000 back and, and off the table. Otherwise, they're going to probably lose the property. Yeah. And in, in most of your clients, you know, whether it's their first you know, venture into this, if it's the first offer they've submitted versus their third or fourth, you know, um, people definitely learn as they go. And sometimes they might 
be a little more hesitant to uh, you know put their best foot forward and and really get aggressive as far as going after the property. But you know you'll temper that and understand you know the will and needs of your clients, and then obviously uh, do the things that they want you to do as far as how hard you're going to go after. Mm -hmm. and, and a good strategy to kind of find out what that price is for your clients is a strategy called laddering. So basically, if the property, let's say, is listed for five hundred thousand, and you ask your client, "Hey, you know, where where do you want to come in at?" They may say five twenty five. You might come back and say, "Okay, that's great." Um, now, if uh, would you be willing to pay another five thousand dollars above that? Would you be willing to pay five thirty, or would you be okay with letting the property go or losing it to somebody else over five thousand dollars? So they may say, well, yeah, no, of course I'll pay 530. Okay, well, well, what about 535? Let's say somebody else is at 535. Would you be willing to go to 535? And then they may say, no, no, you know, 530 is my top. But either way, you can find out where your clients are at and what their mentality is by, by slowly just kind of asking those questions and laddering up and seeing, you know, at what price are they willing to walk away from the property? Yeah, and know too that when you're when you're doing this and making that offer, is it really is the price is right out there in the sense that you know a lot of people go to those those heavy stop numbers, the five twenty five, the five thirty, five fifty, five fifty five. You know, you want your offer to stand out and also be an improvement. You know, know that if you send over a five fifty offer, there's probably three or four others. You know, and and what's a couple three grand. We don't recommend 1,000 over because we just think it's too close. You know, people, it's not, it doesn't move the needle enough to make a difference, but it's something you want to consider. And um, when you are making that offer, you know, throw an odd number in there so it does stand out a little bit more and you do have a better chance of, of putting a gap between you and the next best offer. Yeah, I mean, what, obviously escalation clauses are very popular right now, and we've been using them more and more. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've got uh, some great escalation clause language. Uh, if you'd like that, just reach out to our uh, team manager. You can send a team at mojoscottsdale.com. We'll give you that information again at the end so that if you want to reach out and get that language, you certainly can. But we use uh, escalation clauses, which, for example, if we're on a $500,000 house, it might be our client is willing to pay $5,000 over the next best offer up to a maximum. So let's say it's 525 up to 525. That's where they're willing to go. And then you offer maybe a 510 offer, 515 offer, something yeah. a little bit above list. You want to come just at list because it looks like it, it kind of, you're showing some weakness if you're coming in just at, at list and then saying, oh, but I'll go up to 525 or I'll go up to yeah. 550. Um, so um, keep yeah. that in mind when you're coming up with your yeah assignment. definitely you you want to show a good number with that starting number that gets relatively close to where your escalation clause is uh, because sellers get a little weary of the guy who says you know I'll offer you list price but then I'll go a crazy high number above you know that doesn't stand out to them as much as someone who says hey I'm willing to pay X amount over twenty grand over your you know and then even higher if I need to. So they, they tend to respect that buyer a little bit more because they, you know, they tried harder in the beginning. And obviously you do want to keep the terms clean. Once again, going back to a very clean offer. So for example, you know, maybe you shorten the inspection period instead of a 10 day, maybe you do a seven day or a five day. Um, we don't recommend completely eliminating the inspection period just because I think you're going to open yourself up to a lot of trouble, but um, you know, certainly you can reduce to five days. That gives the inspector plenty of time to get in there and do all the inspections that they want. And if, you know, they need to extend it, maybe the seller would be willing to uh, give them a couple extra days if need be so. But um, maybe doing it as is, doing an as is offer. I think that's really popular right now, letting, letting the seller know that you're not going to nickel and dime them on this or that. Um, you know, once again, something big comes up, like, God forbid, the, it needs a new roof. You could always cancel or potentially go back to the seller and say, hey, I know we offered as is, but um, this house needs a twenty thousand dollars new roof, and my client's not willing to pay that. Would you be willing to either pay it or split it or whatever the, the situation might be? Yeah, as is is uh, it is kind of an interesting, I and mean, it's got to be the right house and right situation. You know, the right buyer clients too. You know, and and some other pre things in there. I know that kind of gets a little thing. We don't recommend getting rid of an inspection period. You can shorten it, but removing it completely. You know, really just opens up some some troublesome things. You want to have a chance to look at that house a little deeper. Absolutely. And then going back to keeping it clean, um, I recommend doing no home warranty just because uh, once again, I, or if you do a home warranty, have the buyer pay for it, have your yep. client pay for it. 
they can always pay for it after they close or at any point in time during the escrow period. But um, I would not have the seller pay for a home warranty, even uh, even HOA transfer fees and costs. I probably would not recommend having the seller pay any of those fees. Once again, we're trying to keep it clean here. Um, something as simple as if the refrigerator isn't in the MLS, maybe you don't ask for the refrigerator. You don't want to lose a house over a thousand dollar refrigerator. So, um, yeah. you know, trying to keep the offer as clean as possible. I mean, and so some of these little things, they, it might sound obvious, but you'd be amazed, you know, it's like, oh, my client will pay 20 grand over, but you know, I'm also going to ask the seller to pay the HOA transfer fee and, and buy the home warranty. And it's like, those, those things sometimes can be more impactful asking for the little nickel and dime stuff. Um, so remove that out of your offer and just get it down to you know pricing terms. Yep. And I, I love putting in a large earnest deposit. So, you know, obviously, you know, a typical earnest deposit might be around 1%. So on a $500,000 house, five grand. But I think having a larger uh, earnest deposit, maybe 10, 15, 20, 25,000, um, really shows a lot of strength and shows that your client really wants the home. And uh, potentially you can even make part of that earnest deposit or the entire thing go hard after the inspection period or after, um, yeah, I mean, pretty much after the inspection period. Um, you could also waive the appraisal. Yeah, it, you know, that's becoming more and more popular, of course, so much so if you didn't know, um, there's in the new additional clause addendum, a waiver of appraisal contingency has been added, which is really quite good. Uh, you know, obviously the Department of Real Estate, you know, sees contract after contract doing this where, where buyers in, are agreeing to waive the appraisal and come up with the difference between asking price and, or purchase price and asking price. And so that's something that uh, it's almost became a requirement in some price ranges for some people because, um, it's just how deals are getting done and someone else is going to do it. So that's another thing really to look at, talk with your clients about the, you know, the, the possibilities of what happens if it doesn't appraise all that good stuff, but it's certainly something to look at. Be flexible on the closing date, or once again, going back to maybe a post-possession, maybe the seller needs a week to, to, you know, pack all their things and move out or a month or two. And even maybe maybe you offer a free post possession. Maybe it's maybe mm -hmm. it's thirty days. They can stay for free, and then and then uh, and then the seller can move after that, and you know transfer it over to your yeah. buyer. So and and honestly, sellers love this. So, and so many are now requesting it in some ways. But you know, for the seller to be able to sell their house and then move when it's kind of convenient, not have to hassle with that. You know, that also presents its own risk. You know, this is the funny thing about these markets is you start doing this thing after thing and, and you know, yeah, buyers are like, check the boxes or uncheck the boxes of buyer protections. And these are all things. So, you know, they, these are individual conversations you need to be having with your buyers, explaining them the pros and cons. And, you know, some buyers are more willing to do it than others, but, um, you know, it's something to, to talk about. That is one way to make your offer stand out. Yeah, and a few last little things is uh, obviously, the buyer could pay the seller's closing costs. Um, that's or a portion of it. A portion of it, you know, maybe three grand or five grand towards the seller's closing costs. Um, the buyer or you as the agent, which we don't recommend necessarily, <laughs> but you potentially could reduce your last commission. Last resort. Last resort. Last resort. So yeah. let's say, you know, they're offering 3% or whatever commission might be. Maybe you reduce it down a thousand or two or, or half a point or whatever it might be. Yeah, you've worked hard for that commission. Don't give it away easily. You know, um, but, and, and we're already seeing a lot of reduced commissions. I mean, 2.5 as opposed to 3% out there. You know, you do what's best for you and, and your offer and your situation, but, you know, don't go cutting at the very first. Yeah. And I don't even know if we've reduced our commission. No, um, I haven't. In, in, any, in any offer. Do. Yeah, it's something you can do. We're just trying to give you as much information as we know and little tips and tricks that we've learned over the years. That but, one's not our favorite. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> probably try to avoid that. But, um, Oh, and then, uh, and then next, when you're going to present the offer, I think having a letter from the buyer, personalized letter that really makes your offer stand out. Um, this does work. This is huge. Because <laughs> if they're getting 20 other offers, but only maybe one or two or three of them actually have like a personalized letter from the, from the buyer, that's yeah. going to make your offer stand out. It's going to make it uh, more of an emotional situation for the seller when they're looking through and trying to weigh which offer is better than the other, especially if you're literally neck and neck with somebody and they don't have a letter and you do, yeah. that's, that's huge. It's, it's totally huge. I mean, 
have them talk about why they like the house, why they like the neighborhood, you know, what are their future plans, uh, you know, some of those things, you know, sellers, you, you get very little information sometimes about the buyers out there and being, them being able to kind of put a package together and relate with that buyer and connect with them can mean the difference of them accepting your offer over another one. I've seen it to where they literally accepted a lower offer because they felt more of a connection with the seller and who they were passing, you know, their house off. Yeah, selling. It, we've even seen where agents have included photos of them and their, or not agents, but the, the buyers have included photos of themselves. And their Pull kids. out all the stops. Or, I mean, or even a video, shooting a video and sending that over with the offer of the, of the buyers and their kids. It's, we've seen agents do that. We're not necessarily saying, yes, go out and do that, but we do know that it does work and other agents have done it. It, it can work and there's a situation where it will work. And so, you know, it, think about it. it. It's something you definitely could use to make an impact. Um, you know, we know, you know, agents routinely are talking about clients they have and they're writing six, seven, eight offers and, and still no acceptance. And then you have to deal with the buyer fatigue, you know, and they start thinking, oh, well, maybe I should just rent for another year or something. So it, it's things like this that you can do to maybe help them get that house that they really, really want. Yep. And then once you submit the offer, make sure you call the listing agent. Once again, have another great conversation with them. Make sure that they confirm receipt of that offer because once again, we're getting so many offers now that things are ending up in junk or spam or maybe it doesn't go out the right way. But uh, make sure you confirm that the listing agent has it. Once again, it's another opportunity to kind of befriend them, talk about how great your, your client is and how great your team or you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then maybe you can kind of pick their brain. Hey, you know, what do you think about my offer? Can you rank it? You know, are we, do you, are we number one? Are we in the lead right now? Or, you know, where, where do we, where do we fall in, in regards yeah. to all the other offers? Some agents are a little, you know, they, they might not want to give you like, oh, you're, you're here or there, but it, it becomes a little easier conversation. You know, if you say, well, how do we, how do we rank? Are we, am I talking, are we in second or are we in third, you know, and, and trying to get a feel, or are we in 14? Um, and it also gives you more information, ammunition to go back to your client and say, hey, talk to them. They said, you know, there are five offers that beat our offer. And so, you know, you're going to have to do X to, to get this house. So those are all good pieces of information and things you want to be able to convey to your buyer. Yep. And then uh, if for some reason you guys do not get the offer, stay positive, you know, for, for not only yourself, but also for your client, you know, we want to keep your client excited and engaged and, you know, willing to go out there and try again. Like Morgan was saying, yeah. a lot of buyers get fatigued. And you don't want your buyer just giving up and saying, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go rent or I'm going to stay put or whatever the situation may yeah. be. So stay positive. Definitely. And let me rewind just one second because we, we missed just a really important one. And that is you've got to have your lender call the listing agent and reach out to them directly and tell them about your mm -hmm. client, tell them about their pre-approval, tell them how far they've gotten along in the process. You know, a while ago, no one was doing this and this moved mountains, literally, because, you know, the listing agent sometimes will chase after the lender, but that call is powerful, especially with the finance deal. People want to go under contract with someone they know is going to close or can close. They want to be under there and a lender that's going to be responsive. So have your lender call. Yep. Well, that pretty much concludes the, the buyer portion of the multiple offer. Um, once again, we feel your pain. We're, we're living in it too. And, and, you know, we're doing our best to, to solidify a lot of these deals that we're offering on. Yeah. Um, but uh, just, and, and sorry if we're going fast, you know, we're just trying to see, uh, you know, deliver as much uh, value and alpha in here as, as possible so that you guys can have some good takeaways and, and things to think about. And we really wanted to like approach this both from the buyer side, now from the listing side. And so that, you know, because we know most of you, both work with buyers and with sellers. Most of us do. And, uh, and there are different strategies, you know, from uh, how to get your buyer the client and how to, how to present your listing the best. Yeah. And so in our seller side, do you want to introduce it? Sure. <laughs> On the seller side, it's uh, how to net your seller the most amount of money, as well as getting him the best terms for, for in a multiple offer situation. Yeah. From a listing agent, seller agent, what else do you want except for to net your seller the most amount of money and get them the best and smoothest terms that work with their, you know, with, with their situation because every situation is different. But so the, yeah. Step number one, <laughs> plan, plan, plan. Yep. Step number one, you know, here's the thing. It's a hot market. 
you know, now what? Now what do I do? Okay, you know, the number one thing is you have to plan. You have to, you have to strategize. Gone are the days, long gone are the days where you can just put the house on the MLS, you know, with a couple of old photos and maybe fill in the photos from your professional photographer maybe in the next week or so and a trickle in showings here or there. Those days are gone. You know, your home is going to have an audience and they're going to be there to either applaud or laugh. So you better be ready. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and there's a lot that goes into the planning. You know, you got to figure out, you know, am I going to have it coming soon? And if so, for how long? And then once, once it goes live, how are we going to execute those showings? Are we going to, you know, with COVID and everything else, are we going to try to split, you know, keep people, you know, distance and whatnot and, and separate those showings every 30, 60 minutes or whatever? Um, are we going to do a big open house or multiple open home houses uh, throughout the weekend? Um, and then what's our plan when we want to respond to offers? Yep. You definitely want to, you know, literally go through and have these clear cut in your head or even write them out. If you're going to do a coming soon listing, our best practices at the absolute most, we think it should be coming soon without showings. Like if you're not going to allow anyone to come see the house, two weeks is the most, you know, because any longer than that, your listing is going to potentially get stale. Some of your best buyers who saw it when it first popped up is coming soon, and then they couldn't see it this weekend. They couldn't see it next and next and next. You know, they're going to kind of lose interest. So we feel like that 14-day window is the most. We actually recommend a shorter time period. Yeah. So what we do with, with our listings is that we would recommend it coming soon on like Sunday, Monday night. You know, right before maybe maybe the maybe the buyer went out and looked at some other homes that weekend, and maybe they're thinking about submitting an offer. But then all of a sudden, your house pops up on Sunday morning as a coming soon. Hmm. Well, now now you now they're starting to question. Okay, do I want to offer on this house or do I want to see this coming soon listing? Once again, we're not allowing any showings during the coming soon, and agents are going to beg you to get into that property. I can promise you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we we think that. The the best practice is essentially listening to that coming soon on a Sunday or Monday with the idea of going live and allowing showings on either Wednesday or Thursday. You know, you can't, you don't want to hold the wolves at bay for too long because they, they do, you know, you're going to field a lot of calls if it's a, if it's going to be a hot property, but if you can set a date and say, Hey, I'm allowing showings on X date and moving forward, uh, we also believe in more of an open showing policy. Don't cram everybody in there in an hour, you know, on a Thursday from 2.15 to 3.15 or something kind of ridiculous like that. You know, allow a good look and people to work with their schedule for at least a couple of days uh, before really reviewing and accepting offers. Yeah, and so if it goes live Thursday morning, that basically gives, gives everyone else who wants to see the property all of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to see the home. Now, we typically recommend when it comes to reviewing all offers, that will all be done Sunday evening. Yeah. Um, usually we say, hey, make sure everyone gets their offer in by 8 p.m. Sunday evening. Sunday evening or, or, or even Monday morning. Yep. You know, it depends on when you go live and how long. Um, if you do have a lot of offers, they're all, you know, uh, you have kind of a response period too. People start expecting a response. But if they know up front, you always want to let them know up front, hey, here's when we're going to report reply to offers and and here's kind of your deadline um you know it can be that sunday evening or it could be that monday morning with the idea that you're going to get back to everybody whatever kind of your preference is but uh, that's how we found it working best and also it it lets people know when they're there and it gives it gives an adequate time for people to see it with you being coming soon for almost a week before if out of towners are coming in you know they have time to book a flight come in You've also said, hey, you've got X amount of time to come in and look at this house. And that's a, that's a comforting feeling for some buyers, you know, um, when they're booking plane tickets, they are coming from out of town. Yep. And, and uh, what's a really good idea is to put in the agent remarks that you are going to be responding to all offers by this day and this time. That way then everyone knows. And you don't have to field 50 or 100 phone calls of agents asking you, you know, do you have any offers? And when are you responding to offers and this and that? At least you can at least give some information and kind of set that expectation. So definitely make sure in the agent remarks that you you note that. Yeah, for sure. So you know, moving forward, you know, so we talked about kind of the offers. Let's talk about pricing the home effectively. You know, which is better? Is it is it better to shoot for the moon or is it better to give a 
you know, fair and marketable price? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, we've had clients that have wanted to shoot for the moon and it's worked out, especially in this market. And that, but what we do, what we feel as, as professionals and we're advising our clients is that coming up with a good, strong list price to where you're not over exceeding, you know, what other buyers' expectations might be. Um, you're coming in at a very attractive, but, you know, higher aggressive. price. Aggressive. Um, and, uh, and once again, as professionals, it's our job to educate our clients and go through all the comps with them and look at all the information and, and compare to, you know, properties not six months ago or five months ago, but ones that have sold in the last 30 to 60 days. Yeah. When, when we're looking through comps, um, you know, we're really kind of discounting or you've got to add value back in for anything over the 90 days, anything older than, than closed 90 days ago. You know, frankly, the market was different then and, and prices were different. We're not only looking at sold comps, because sold comps are old news. We want to look at pending comps. And one thing we definitely recommend, you know, it, Going back, we, we skip one thing too, is you've got to get your listing agreement signed. If you have an upcoming listing and you're getting there, get the listing agreement signed yesterday. There's so many options for sellers in this market. The neighbor's looking for a house. The neighbor's neighbor is looking for a house. You know, Cousin Eddie from around the corner was going, to, going out knocking doors. The, if you don't have a listing agreement, that listing, your hot new listing is going to sell out from under you from the seller working a deal with somebody in the neighborhood who found out he's selling, yep. you know, it's, it's going to go. So number one, get your listing agreement, you know, get your foot in, you know, where, where your flag is planted firmly and then get to work with that. And like I said, when you're looking at those comps and everything else, um, you know, go, th go over the pending sales, look at other things in the neighborhood that have sold quick. What did they move for? We actually recommend even calling that agent, talking to them. How many offers did you get? Okay. Well, how far, over asking, you know, they might not give you a number, that's fine. You can get kind of a percentage or a ballpark or an idea. You know, once you have a listing agreement, it's perfectly fine to say, hey, well, I've got an upcoming listing in the neighborhood and I'm just doing some due diligence for my client. Yeah. Now, what do we do if a client does want to list way over the comps? Let's say, let's say the house, once again, we think the comps are right around 500,000 and they want to list at 600,000. What would you do? <laughs> I would, you know, the, the, with this market, if the fact is, is that with a moderate or a fair list price, you're going to attract more buyers and it's going to get bid up to its fair and marketable price. Um, you know, so we definitely suggest putting a price in that's going to attract more buyers and generate more interest. If you go on super high, you're going to, you're going to kick half your buyers out of the water. Uh, just just right off the bat. And yeah, we just need one buyer. But at the same time, you know, people are paying a high price for properties because they get in, they get emotionally attached and they get involved. If you priced it so high that, you know, that, that the opposite is happening where people are walking through and going, hey, I'd never pay that for this house. You know, you're probably not going to get your list price or even close. You're going to spend a little time on the market. And then, you know, you're, you probably may have a stigma and you may finally reduce it to a better number. And people still don't care. I think it's pretty funny because uh, I think properties are getting a stigma even faster in this market oh, sure. than than any other market. Normally, it's like, oh, the market, the, the house is on the market for you know four months. You know what's wrong with it? And it's like, oh, well, you know that's actually not that long. You know most properties sell between three to six months. Yada yada. In this market, with properties flying off the market, if it's been on the market for over thirty days, people are like, what's wrong with this house? Yeah. It's, it's taking a long, it's just going quick and people definitely are saying, hey, what's happening here? Is it listed too high? Is there an issue? Um, you know, so that's, that's something you want to take into account and think about when it comes to pricing strategies and just kind of looking at it. Yeah. Um, well, we'd probably try and talk them down from the 600 down to maybe 550, maybe a little bit more of a reasonable list price. And then from there, just have a verbal agreement with them that, hey, look, Let's uh, every two to three weeks, let's strategize. And if we need to make a price adjustment, you know, just at least Mr. You know, seller, please, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, please be on board. And, uh, and uh, you know, we want to try and get this house sold for you. So we'll know within the first two to three weekends, whether or not um, yeah. we're going to have to make that adjustment. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, the seller's the boss and uh, you're there to advise and present the numbers. And you know what, if, if they think they can get that for their house, I mean, sometimes you have to acquiesce and just say, 
you know, and that, that's how it goes sometimes, but you're there to look at the comps, help them evaluate and really see what's selling, how quick it's selling, what other homes could do and, you know, and then go from there. Yep. Now, I, I think uh, also part of that planning process is, uh, you know, what do you do with, with the multiple offers? Do you do a multiple counter? Do you do highest and best? Does your client just pick one and move forward with it? Um, I think all options are on the table, but once again, you kind of want to know what you're going to do going into it. Have this conversation with the seller so that you guys are both on the same page. And, and once again, there's not like one right way, you know, and every, every offer is different, every situation, every house is different. Um, but you're going to want to at least have that conversation with the, with the seller. Usually we recommend, um, once again, making it so that all offers are to be submitted by Sunday, call it by 8 p.m. And then a lot of times we'll go back to the top two or three or four offers and then request highest and best by, by Monday at noon. Um, and, then, uh, and then from there you can, you know kind of pick and choose which offer you want to go go forward with or do you want to take two of them and and share the details as long as the seller has said yep go ahead um, i'm okay with you sharing price or terms or whatever like that as long as you have their permission um then potentially and you make it fair for everyone you just don't want to share the terms and pricing with one agent and their clients and not the other so you've got to have a fair uh fair playing field um yeah. but yeah, on That's certain properties, on certain properties and price points, if you're listing a home and you know almost assuredly it is going to receive multiple offers and sell potentially for over asking or you find yourself in that scenario, you should have a pretty good idea because you've talked to the other agents in the neighborhood, you know that you've you've got it at a price that's reasonable and takes all the market conditions into account, you know, and that properties are going to appreciate, maybe you've built in a little of that appreciate. But anyway. You've got that that offer. You know you're getting multiple offers. You know there's two ways. You can either be open with the price and the terms, um, or you know be more coy about it and everything else. And with the seller's permission, we we definitely like the open and honest model. And just kind of starting out from the beginning when agents call and want to make an offer, you know just being upfront. Hey, I've got an offer. I'm at full price. But people are okay with this if they know they're going to be treated just as open as the next guy. And so that's really a, a key thing, you know, when you are having that conversation. And the other number one thing is you really wanna have clear and concise communication with the agent. And this goes back to planning, where you know what you're gonna do and you tell them what you're gonna do. Hey, I'm gonna be reviewing all offers on Monday morning. You've got till Sunday night to give me the offer over. Uh, the seller's gonna look at it. We plan to get back to everybody by lunch. Um, you know, I've got three offers on the table. You know, I'm 10,000 over list currently. Uh, and they're aware that the other offers are there. So. Yeah, and I, and I think this is, a, this is a, a point in the negotiation where you can really get your seller the best terms is because it, with the seller's permission, if they're okay with you sharing the terms of any other offer, you can go back to may, maybe there is a higher offer. Maybe there is a higher offer that's, you know, five grand higher or whatever like that. Or there's one that's, you know, Maybe one's cash, one's finance. Like I said, every situation is different, but you can go back and say, hey, look, I know you're, you're financed, but if you were to waive the appraisal, you know, we would strongly consider your offer. Or if you were to reduce the inspection period down to five days, or if you were to buy it as is, you know, here's all terms that maybe another offer or two have put into their offers, but you can share those terms and get your client the best terms. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it gives, you're putting the ammunition back to the buyer and just, it, you know, it's an open playing field in the sense of like, hey, I, I need to know someone's already gone 50,000 over. Do I, you know, do I want to go 60? You know, is that going to get me the house, you know, and being able to know the numbers and then move forward with it. Um, you know, buyers appreciate a little more certainty because going back to that, you know, they sleep better at night knowing that, hey, I put my best foot forward, but somebody else came out and just flat out outbid me. They went way over and above where I would ever want to go. Um, you know, that's, that can be easier a little bit than, uh, than just not knowing, but just knowing you lost the deal. Yep. And, and you know, once again, post possessions or leasebacks are very popular right now. I had a deal that it just closed last month where my seller said, we absolutely need a 60 day post possession. And I said, okay, that's great. I'm, I put it actually in the, in the agent remarks. So everyone knew that this was very important to the seller. 
And then anytime anyone called and asked about the property, once again, I shared it with them and said, hey, look, the seller is most likely not going to consider an offer that doesn't have this post possession, or they're going to counter back with the post possession. So I just want to give you that, that heads up, you know, so that you know what you're dealing with and what your client's dealing with. And so that, that way, then we only have buyers that are willing to give that post possession. Yeah, certainly. So hopefully these have been a few good tips. We look forward to some of your questions at the end. And, you know, once again, please save all those questions for the end. But, um, you know, we look forward to any of your questions about from the buy side or the listing side, different things we've seen, different ways that we, you know, kind of like to present that um, to our clients. So, you know, on the listing side, like we said, going back, just be prepared for the onslaught. If you've got a property, you really want to plan. We think an extra week, if, it, if it's an extra week in prep before you can get your home on the market, but you really make sure that that everything is dialed into a T and you're ready to go, it, we think I think it's well worth it. Um, you know, rather than coming in kind of sloppily to the market and and figuring it out, um, I don't think that's going to present as well. You know, I, I view it more as almost like you're unveiling. You know, the curtain is being pulled back on this listing, and you you want it pretty well perfect. Yeah, have it polished. Have the HOA disclosure filled out. Have the seller disclosures filled out. Have everything ready to go. So that way, when you hit the market, people are going to be requesting all that information. You've got it right at your fingertips and you can just start handing all that stuff over. Yep. You're, you're set up and, and even receipts, you know, for recent improvement, some of these things, you know, all those pieces are valuable for getting your seller the, the best number. You know, when you can, when you can say, Hey, yeah, they put a new roof on and I'll send you the roof receipt, you know, I mean, whatever you want to do, but each step within there the better prepared you are for the interest for the activity you know the higher price you're likely to get absolutely so on that note yeah is the market crashing <laughs> sooner or later maybe yeah <laughs> at some point the nice thing about predicting a market crash is that you're always going to be right i mean it's going to happen at some, at point, some time, point but it might be like 10 20 years down the road but i have to say unequivocally no yeah I'm not in phoenix not in the foreseeable future yeah you know we're and we'll get into reasons why but um we we've looked we've studied everything we've gone through the compo report we've been reading i mean we're we're constantly digging in and diving deep you know um both josh and i were were agents back throughout the uh the last you know housing market crash and also the rebound you know we saw that we also saw so you learned a lot from that uh experience you know we were selling homes in 2007, 2008, and 9, 10, and so forth and so on. And you know what, what we noticed were there were signs. There were some major signs and major red flags that were poking up that people were ignoring. And so you know when you're looking for some of these same signs, but we look back and say, man, how did we not see this? How did we not see that? And what's different now is, you know, we do dive deep. We do, we're looking for those signs. We're looking for the signs of continuation and of it potentially crashing, which uh, those aren't, there aren't those signs. Yeah. And I think everyone's a little skittish because we just, you know, the, the crash wasn't that long ago. And, you know, we all pretty much lived through it in one way, shape or form. And so I think everyone's just very nervous and skittish, like, oh, that happened you know, uh, 12 years ago or 13 years ago, and, and it's going to happen again. And I want to, I want to sell my house right now so that, so that I can rent because I'm, I'll try and, I'll try and catch the market again on the dip you know, or, or as a buyer, I don't want to buy right now because I just want to wait. And I'm, I'm going to wait for prices to get better because yeah. the market's going to pull back. Here's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, the stock market really crashed in 2008 and that slowed the housing market down, but the housing market had already started slowing down before 2008. It really peaked in about 2006 and then was, was still moving up pretty high. Uh, in 2008 is where it started to retrace, but it was not until late 2010 and early 2011 before prices bottomed out. Okay, so we're talking about a three year cycle from 08, but really when, when the market started to ease up, you know, four to five years before pricing bottomed and, you know, the deals were amazing, so to speak. So when someone says, hey, I wanna wait for prices to come back down, you know, good luck. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that that's and, it. that's actually if they come back down. Yeah. But you know, there there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, predictors back in that day that you could you could you know or in numbers that you could uh, go back to. For example, rental rates were decreasing as home prices were increasing and making it more attractive for people to rent and not to buy. Number one, you Number, know. Yeah, and the big reason for that is investors were coming in and, you know, no doc, stated income, stated asset loans were allowing, you know, investors or potential investors to buy two and three houses that they never had any intention of occupying. They just bought them as rental properties. But when you have a flood of, in, that, that flood of the inventory of rental properties and there just wasn't enough renters, we also got a little overbuilt, but that's why rental rates were dropping while prices were increasing all throughout 2006, 2007. So this was a major sign that uh, a downturn was coming. Yeah, we basically had very little demand for people, for uh, owner-occupied properties and a huge supply of properties that were, that were sitting vacant. So that's sure. one of the biggest reasons why the market started to soften and and later crash. And, and if you're unaware of where we are right now, currently rental rates are increasing even faster than home prices. And so our, our issue right now, we, there's a few things of, of why our market is not gonna crash. And, and one of the biggest ones is just you know supply and demand. Um, and, and everybody goes back to that, but it, it really is true. You know, the builders, we were, we, they more or less stopped building there after 2008. And, and weren't pulling as many permits or anything else. And, and I like to say that there was really not that much built from 08 all the way to about 2014, 2015. By then the home builders kind of came back and started ramping up inventory and everything else. Uh, but now we have this other unique situation to where COVID has completely uh, gotten the way of supply lines and you know, lumber prices are through the roof. Uh, builders, you know, Fulton Homes just sent out a thing this month saying they don't have roofing materials for over 1,100 homes, and they're not exactly sure when they're going to get them. And so they don't know how long delays are going to be, but the, the supply of new homes coming to the market is really constrained right now, and it still is. They're building as fast as they can, but, but uh, materials are not keeping up. Yeah, re recently I heard, uh, and I don't, I haven't, I haven't validated this, but Heard that uh, if not another person moved to the valley, it would take two years for the builders to build enough homes to, to supply everyone that's looking to buy a home right now. Yeah, and that's correct. That was from the Cromford uh, report that- um, oh, there we they, go. Yeah, they did a monthly report. Was verified. It's, it's a little under two years, but it's very close. And, and the reason is, is because, because built, nobody built anything, we really got underbuilt as far as the number of homes for our population growth. You know, just because the, the market slowed down, our population, people moving here to the Valley didn't, didn't decrease. It's kept steady, you know, one and a half percent growth. And we are, we're seeing even more than that growth right now uh, with our influx of new population moving here. And the supply is just not there. One of the reasons that's leading to our current, you know, housing shortage or super hot sellers market. Mm -hmm. And one of the other biggest uh, issues, and I know we kind of, touch on this just a bit, but uh, uh, lending policies were completely different back in 2006, 7, 8. And, you know, basically you could do no stated loans. Uh, you could buy multiple properties. Well, everyone jokes about, oh, the guy who worked at McDonald's who, was, who owned 10 properties or whatever. Um, but that, you know, so there is some, some truth in that. And that, that people are getting greedy and they're buying multiple properties and they were overextending themselves. Now, you know, lending, lending practices are a lot tighter. It's a lot more difficult to get a loan, especially if you're going through a bigger bank. Um, and yeah, I mean, they want to they wanna make sure, especially with COVID, you know, that they're, they're checking your employment at the beginning of the loan and also again at the end, because yeah. they want to make sure that you are employed and that you are going to be able to, you know, qualify for that loan. Yeah, I mean, lending policies are completely different. If you're an investor looking to buy an investment property, I mean, you're putting at least 20% down, in most cases, 25, even 30%. Uh, you know, that right there has stopped just, you know, a lot of your, your mom and pop investors might have maybe buying that second or third property because the barriers are entry. So, you know, and there, the, the properties aren't out there to purchase anyway. As you guys all know, you know, our inventory shortage is, we're at the lowest levels we've seen. 
um, hovering up on the average about 4,000 for the MLS. If you take out, you know, the Prescott listing and the Flagstaff and that, that number's closer to 3,000 at any one time. Um, so we're seeing appreciation, appreciation for good reason. Uh, the case Shiller Index has ranked Phoenix number one again in the United States, and we're expected to have 15.6% appreciation this year alone. And we're definitely seeing that on the streets. You know, home prices, land prices are moving up. And, and I, I tell my clients all the time, I said, hey, it's a little like a moving train. You know, you, you just want to get a ticket and get aboard because if you're standing there, the, the train's going to leave the station and it's no telling when the next one's coming around. Yeah. I mean, basically, and they're even predicting even next year for, for us to still see appreciation, maybe, maybe somewhere between 10 to 12 percent appreciation next year. Um, obviously, you know, the numbers are always kind of moving. It kind of depends on what policies uh, the current administration puts in the, in the practice and whatnot. But um, I think that if you have a buyer that is waiting and predicting that the market's going to decrease or go down, I can predict that they're probably going to be pretty disappointed a year yeah. or two from now. Yeah. I mean, we're going to assume that there's not a national calamity and there's not a major nationwide recession and everything else. If, if things stay more or less as they are, this market's going nowhere but up. Um, and a big reason is the lack of new inventory. Our economic growth is, is really off the charts and very impressive. You know, they're doing some great things at the statewide level as far as bringing businesses here. Um, you know, between 2015 and 2019, there were over 519 companies that relocated major operations to the Phoenix metro area. Um, another stat that's out there, if you didn't know, Taiwan Semiconductor just uh, inked a deal with the city of Phoenix for a large parcel right up by the 17 and the 303, where they're going to put a new chip plant in. Intel just announced just a week or two ago the $20 billion expansion of their operations, you know, adding thousands of high paying jobs. Um, Samsung is eyeing two different plants in the valley. You've got Nationwide up north in Scottsdale for State Farm. Uh, the list of businesses that are moving here or expanding their operations, you know, is, is growing and growing exponentially. And that's, you know, and these people have to have somewhere to live. They're moving employees here. And, and these are some of the people paying way over asking for prices because they have to have somewhere to live. Yeah, we're a very business friendly state. And a lot of businesses are moving here, as Morgan just stated. And, and uh, the cost of living is, is, is we're, we're, we're still pretty good. We're, we're still in that mid range. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, so we've got a lot of businesses. Once again, the, the, our economy here in Arizona is incredible. Um, we're one of the top ranked states in, in regards to our economy and our growing economy. And, uh, yeah. you know, besides that, I think there's a lot of migration that's happening. Definitely. I mean, it's not just about the weather, but the weather still is a is a big draw and factor. But a lot of people are moving here regardless of the weather. They're moving here for jobs. And, you know, we're also looking forward. You know, we're in this first wave of the baby boomers retiring. And so speaking of weather and people moving for a, you know, a nicer climate and everything else, you know, those are a lot of the people we're seeing that are moving here for the weather, getting south, getting the southwest, it's better for their health. And so that doesn't show any signs of slowing. We know by the numbers, you know, the baby boomers are one of the largest generation. And, you know, a lot of them are, have worked their whole lives. They have, you know, healthy 401ks. They have, you know, they, they own multiple properties or own their single family home. They come, they come pretty well, well pocketed to come into Arizona and buy a home outright for them to retire in for the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, they're tired of shoveling the snow and plowing their driveways and everything else. And a long commute into the city, you know, I mean, there's, there's so many reasons, but um, yeah, yeah, we're, 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 a, we're a pretty amazing state. So. so what, yeah, so when you look at it and you look at it, you know, cause we all have friends and everything else. And, and honestly, you know, when, when people say, hey, I, I plan to sell and maybe rent for a year, I say, good luck. I, I, I caution them because I just really, from my perspective, do not see that in our cards right now. None of the numbers are signs of seven. It would take a nationwide event 
So let's a catastrophic event. Yeah, let's hope we don't see one more. Or, or like that would be bad. Like maybe interest rates like drastically increase, which yeah. would which would really uh, slow things down quite a bit. But yeah, we do not foresee the market crashing or even declining any time in the near future, in the foreseeable future. So yeah, and that's a big part of the reason we wanted to put this together for you because you know we think if you're armed with some of the best tips and tricks and practices, this. The market as we see it, I mean, I think this is going to be the market moving forward for the foreseeable future. Definitely through the summer, if they are a buyer, maybe stuff kind of flatlines a little bit late summer um, and fall. And that's, that's, I think, some buyer's hopes. And I think it's a, a valid one. Um, that's usually a good time to be a buyer. So we'll see how it goes this year. Yeah, we're, uh, you know, we, um, we always like to arm our team members with all this information. We're constantly giving and giving and giving as much as we possibly can. And, um, you know, we're still looking for another good agent or two. So if you have any interest or think that this, that our team might be a good fit for you, please do not hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, even just getting feedback from, from this webinar would be great. So we- Yeah, definitely. I mean, Josh and I run this, uh, this, this webinar, we do it once a quarter and stuff, but we're meeting with our team on a constant, you know, a weekly basis. Uh, we have events to where we're doing team meetings and and getting in front of them, um, you know, and then we always like to be available just for calls. We've got a great system and structure in place to uh, to really help, honestly, you know, our agents do everything they can do in this market and, uh, and get out there and, and succeed. So yeah. new, uh, and, new and seasoned agents. Yep. New so. and seasoned agents. We've got, you know, so we'd, we'd love to chat with you if you've been interested, if you'd like to look into something like that, if you're looking for a little more support, some structure, leads, people to work with. Accountability. Yep. So yeah, on that note, I guess uh, we will refer to uh, you, Justin and Christine for questions, anything that's yep. come through over the last hour.